Hello, and welcome to the first of many interviews and instructional videos being produced by the Article Association. Today I'm joined by Deepa Vaya, who is Vice Chair of the Racial Diversity Campaign, as well as former Diversity Officer and fierce campaigner for diversity and equality overall. Hello Deepa, and thank you for joining me today. How are you? Hi, thanks for having me, Dad. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Doing well. Somewhat nervous. This is my first time interviewing somebody, so I'm nervous as well. <laughs> no, right. I'm nervous as well. <laughs> so, on to my first question. As I mentioned in my introduction, you're a former vi diversity officer, the current vice chair of the Racial Diversity Campaign, and former aide to the vice president of the Liberal Democrats. Could you tell us a little of what is, what is involved and what was involved with those roles? Okay, so I'll start with the most recent and then work my way down. So I'm currently the vice chair for the racial diversity campaign and the main priority for this organization is to ensure those who are from a diverse background are helped when they would like to stand as candidates through selection, approval and election. And that's what our role is and we're here to support you. And we've basically come out, this whole group has been set up from the Allardyce review and um, it's in the very early stages, but yeah, we've got some exciting plans. Um, so I was also an aide to Isabel Paraslam, who's the Vice President of the Liberal Democrats, and my main achievement in that role was mostly organising a trip for 10 people to Brussels last October, nice. uh, in the first two weeks of a new job, <laughs> oh, somehow I managed to pull it off. Um, so yeah, that was really good fun. Um, learned a lot about how the EU works, also got a Q&A session with Sheila Ritchie, Judith Bunting and Lucy Nespenga, and that was really insightful. Um, having not been to fossils for at least, I would say, four years. Yeah. So it's really insightful. Being a politics student, I was, yeah. <laughs> I was just like in my element. Um, so yeah, I absolutely love that trip. And then before that, I was a diversity officer for Watford Liberal Democrats, which I guess kind of sparked my interest in diversity. Yeah. Um, and I was basically encouraged to kind of create events um, alongside um, my local party. So at the time we had, so I'm very lucky to live in a Liberal Dem constituency in Watford and we have an elected mayor called Dorothy Thornhill at the time. And I worked closely with her uh, parliamentary assistant, Mike Shaw, and he was really supportive in ensuring that any events that we did. So we organised a International Women's Day event, which was Watford's first International Women's Day event with Belinda Brooks Gordon, who is on ALDE, and a few local speakers that had over like 25 attendees. He also organised a diversity dinner with Shafat Mohammed, former MEP, yeah. current uh, Lib Dem council leader for Sheffield, and also um, took a group of local councillors to Diwali at the temple, which they really enjoyed. Um, and it was really nice showing them how we celebrate the Hindi New Year. So yeah. in a nutshell, yeah. that's kind of the story around diversity. And I guess the other thing I could also mention is that in 2016, I also created a survey alongside five other people, one of which is Natasha Chapman, who's an amazing <laughs> local campaigner in Lincolnshire, um, and Pauline Pierce, otherwise known as the Hackney Heroin. And we created a survey just to kind of gauge how members are feeling towards engaging with the SAOs and AOs that we have. The SAOs are a special associated organisation and the AO is an associated organisation. So those include Young Liberals, LGBT+, Plus, um, LDRCE, uh, LDDA, and there's probably a few others that I've forgotten. Um, but those were the main ones that we specifically asked people about. And we've got 132 responses. Myself and Pauline Pierce presented that to Lib Dem HQ. A snap general election happened. <laughs> nothing was able to happen, but it was still quite interesting and like, seeing those responses and being able to kind of go, this is what we know. Um, yeah. And also I probably should shout out April Preston as well, federal board member, Worthington Liberal Democrat campaigner extraordinaire. <laughs> um, she also invited me to speak on a event at conference called Feminism, Feminism? How to Apply Feminism Liberally. Probably got the name wrong, but I really enjoyed that as well. And that, all sparked, that was all sparked off from the Diversity Monitoring Group survey. So yeah. yeah kind of been interested in this for at least four years yeah um so, so um a lot of what i took away from your answer was that a huge amount of your experience and your love for this role has come from coming in from the ground up from the grassroots level 
And certainly I know from my own experience that there's a great deal of learning and sort of, I suppose, exposure to your life that comes through that route, um, especially compared to somebody who might get parachuted into the role who might not necessarily know what it's like. How much of an advantage would you say it has been to you um, as you've been moving forward in your career, especially around diversity and equality? I think it's so important for me to have like a grassroots understanding of how things work. I think at the time in 2016, it was kind of unheard of to have diversity officers. Yeah. Um, and I think myself and I, the reason I got into the role, really interesting story, St. Albans had a diversity officer and I was like nudging Peter Taylor, who's now the mayor at the time, um, and was like, why is what not got a diversity officer and I was like I'll do it and then they kind of co-opted me into the role and then it was just very much go ahead and kind of do whatever you want spark your own interest they let me go with the flow and like inject all my ideas and kind of implement them really effectively with a very supportive team around me so yeah I do think it's vitally important to have the grassroots campaigning because I think even in the role that I'm in now it's so candidate focused but you don't just wake up one day and go oh I want to become a candidate you might have a journey in the party you might be a local party member you might be on a local party executive then go for a federal committee and then be like oh I want to become a lived in parliamentary candidate or an MSP or the Welsh equivalent and it's so important that you have a journey and you're able to explain that journey so I think for me personally having a grassroots level understanding has been really helpful because one I've been able to learn I've been able to kind of engage with the context that I do have and I still talk to them to this day about yeah. stuff I'm doing because you're building your network and essentially you're engaging with people from all different walks of life and like I'm so grateful to meet people from like I'm going to talk about Shafak quite a lot in this video but I'll just say like Shafak Mohammed for example uh, the fact that he came to a diversity dinner that was organized by myself and he was able to explain how he engaged with the beanie community in Sheffield, that was so insightful for places like Watford because although we do have fairly large beanie community, it is very different to those that live in Sheffield. And it was so insightful just hearing what Shepard had to say. And I think even now, I'm very much aware of the fact that if I do need some advice on something specifically related to engaging with diverse members, on a topic such as, let's say, for instance, it's Ramadan. Ramadan's coming up fairly soon. I want to kind of tailor my comms towards um, wishing everyone a happy Ramadan. Yeah. I might reach out to Shafak, or I might reach out to Cameron Hussein, who's the Leeds Northwest MP, PPC candidate. And it's really good to have these contacts because you're essentially building your network and you're building the base. So then when I've gone into other roles, I've always carried the network with me and expanded it as I've gone along and you learn so much. And I think compared to being parachuted in, at least I've kind of, I feel like I've got a lot of experience on the ground um, from like jumping into different roles and learning new things to kind of implement in the vice chair role. So I found it really useful. Oh, that's good. So um, that quite neatly leads into my second question, really. Um, You mentioned before um, how much of your work interacts with SAOs and AOs. And of course, the Lib Dems are a party that likes to decentralise power as much as possible. But of course, there's still the core of the um, party itself. There's the federal party, the various regional parties, the national parties, etc. The party itself, I mean, as a party, the Liberal Democrats stand for the fundamental values of liberty and equality, as well as seek to foster diversity what would you say the party gets right in terms of equality and diversity so i think there's a lot of things that have happened especially since i've been a member so i joined in 2013 during the coalition years no one hate me <laughs> um but i so i joined off the back of an internship with emld and i had the option of joining the party or joining emld to join the party um and i think there were a lot of interesting things that we were able to pass while we were in coalition guaranteed but everything we did in coalition was amazing but we did make some massive achievements for instance in 2013 Lynn Fairstone passing the same-sex marriage bill through parliament was a massive thing for yes. Liberal Democrats and I think it's something that has still a very prominent issue now the fact that in 2014 people who are LGBTQ plus were not able to marry their partners is beyond me and in 2015 
it was legal and right. they were able to marry their partners. That's such a big deal for people in society. And I think that was a really good thing the party did and we're very much very strong on our LGBTQ rights and how we um, express them and explain them. So, yeah, very proud of that. Um, come as no surprise that I'm going to mention Joe Swinton. Um, so Joe Swinton also passed the Shared Parental Leave Bill in 2015, which encouraged the people who were um, looking to be or have a family, um, they were unable to have shared parental leave. So if the, part, the partner or, yeah, if the partner would like to have shared parental leave, there was an option to do that, which was basically they could have leave up to 50 weeks and it could be 37 weeks of pay between two people, which is so such a big deal. And I think that's one of my, aside from the LGBTQ, our part from the same sex marriage bill, that is such an achievement for the party. Um, fast forward to 2016, um, the revenge porn bill was a really big deal as well because of the way that it gave people anonymity. And I think at the time it wasn't a criminal offence beforehand. And because of that, because of our party, it is now a criminal offence. So that's a really big deal. Um, 2017, we had the gender neutral uniform, which was something that I'm kind of really proud about because when you think about, when I think about my childhood, I wasn't the sort of person that would wear skirts. I'd always wear trousers yeah. and I don't know why people would feel like they need to be forced to wear a skirt or trousers. There should be options for both and it shouldn't be forced on people. There should just be options. So I think the Scottish Liberal Democrats backing that motion was a really big deal and will hopefully make people going through the education system feel more comfortable, especially when it comes to what they need, what they have to wear as their school uniform. Um, in 2018, um, Bill Hubhouse passed the and private members bill about upskirting, making that a criminal offence. So before that, it wasn't a criminal offence. Um, upskirting is when people can take a photo beneath someone's clothing without their consent. So that is something that happens in the society we live in, unfortunately. Yes. But um, I think Gina Martin campaigning on that and Bill Hubhouse passing that bill has made a massive difference. And I can, I'm going to add one other thing on bias. Um, <laughs> but having a, a, a directly elected female leader in 2019 is something that I'm so proud of. And right. I think those people who know me know that I was part of that campaign. So I think directly electing our first female leader is something I'm going to cherish forever. But yeah. I think those are just a little snapshot of what we have done since 2013 till now. Oh. Um, it's actually an impressive list. I don't think I would describe it as a little sh snapshot of that. Um, that's a huge chunk of the... MEPs. Yeah, yeah, I forgot to mention MEPs. So I'm just going to say Shafat Mohammed as well. <laughs> <laughs> no surprise. No surprise. I think electing all the MEPs that we did in 2019 is such a big deal. I briefly mentioned how I visited the European Parliament with 10 other people from diverse backgrounds from across the UK. But I think... Um, Shafat being on the committee yeah. for um, women's rights and gender equality and the fact that he was able to speak at events specifically in um, Nairobi, Pakistan about why gender equality is important within those societies and across the world and why it's such a big deal is really important. He also did an independent article on reproductive rights and I think that broke barriers within itself because you never think someone who is from Shafat's background would be talking about that. Yeah. It's not heard of. So the fact that Shafat did that broke barriers within itself. Um, so yeah, he definitely needs to do a podcast at some point. But yeah, that's what I'd say as well in terms of the MEP. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you mentioned it as a little list. That is not a little list. I mean, if you look back <laughs> at the past 10 years in terms of the... Um, push towards increasing diversity and equality. Um, and you look at what the Tories and Labour have done. Frankly, the Lib Dems are very much taking the lead on this. So, mm -hmm. and you're very much an integral part of that. So, I would say this small isn't part. a little bit. No, no, no. The small parts, but small parts are also integral as well. So, we are very lucky that we have such a vocal party that is able to make this change in the last what, four or five years. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So, um, I mean, I did mention um, a little bit ago um, that the Lib Dems have very much been at the front of 
pushing for diversity and equality, especially in the past decade. But of course, no political party is perfect. What areas do you think the Lib Dems could do better on? So this is something I'm going to talk a lot about internal politics and the way that we work as an internal party, because I think this all stems back to what we do on the inside that impacts the outside. So um, there are things like communicating our messages better to people from diverse communities or people who are LGBT plus or people who are disabled or anyone that isn't a white male, quite frankly. Um, I think accessibility and the way that we provide our training platforms. I know we have webinars, that's great, but I think the way we communicate things needs to be accessible. It needs to be from the grassroots up, not the top down approach, because it doesn't always work. That's the way I found it most effective. Um, so I think that's one thing that's really important. Um, terribly sorry, we, we, we cut up a little bit here. Um, I think I crossed what you said. Um... Um, when you came in um, uh, in the role as a diversity officer, you had um, a lot of support around you, a good team around you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think what's really important is giving diversity officers that support. So having, I was very lucky when I was the diversity officer, but I had an amazing team around me. So I had Dorothy Thornhill, Mike Shaw, amazing, Ian Sotheby, amazing, really, really supportive of me. But I'm not sure everyone else has that kind of network and supportive team around them. So I think we need to provide best for, for people who are diversity officers. And it also is working in coordination with people across the council. So I'm very lucky that I have, the Lib Dems always talk about family. And I think for me, it's always really important to have people from all different walks of life in the group that I hang out with. Yeah. And when I was in the role of the diversity officer, I created this committee of Watford and St. Albans people. And we all came together and we were like, how are we going to encourage more females to stand in Parliament? And at the time, 5050 Parliament had a campaign called Ask Us to Stand. And it was encouraging females to stand in Parliament. That was only possible because I had people from all different walks of life across the council involved and encouraging each other. It's not just females working with females or males working with males. It's us all working together collaboratively to make that difference. So I think that's really important. Um, tokenism, I'm going to bang on about this a lot. <laughs> so there are times in the party where I feel that people from diverse backgrounds have been pushed to the front of a part of the picture to make it feel, make it look better in a nutshell. So there's a lot for us to learn on that. We are not just little figurines that you can push yeah. forward and push back. You do have feelings and there are more important things that we could be doing instead of being tokenistic and adding some diversity to a photo. Um, so there's a lot to work on in that sense. Um, I think there's a lot to work on in terms of stereotyping and unconscious bias. So the fact that there are some members of staff that I've spoken to whilst researching the vice chair role that have told me that they were assume to be family members or the child of a certain person when they've been out campaigning not normal mm. like we need to stop that sort of lang like sort of rhetoric being the norm because essentially that's what's going to push people away instead of current encouraging them to work with us and create better members in our party i think it's very important that we communicate essentially communicate accessibility transparency and also having that adapting our way to the fact that we don't need to be tokenistic in the way that we do things there are bigger and better things that we can be doing with those members to allow them to flourish which is why hopefully the visual diversity campaign and the campaign for gender balance and all the other federal quality committees and everything else is here to help us all succeed in whichever way we like but we're only able to do that if we all work together and we work collectively and we share best practice because it's not going to happen overnight. It's not something that we can just go, yeah, let's join the party and campaign on diversity for you because, like, it doesn't happen overnight. Like, it's going to take a long time for things to change and yeah. we all need to work collaboratively in order to do that. It's something that will take time, but hopefully will pay off in the long run. Um, I was actually going to follow up with um, the kind of strategies and training schemes that you would have liked to have seen in place. But to be honest, you've covered pretty much all of them. But I think um, we both know actually with um, 
we can have all the strategies in the world in place, training, videos, instructional um instructional videos and, and that kind of thing. The problem is if people don't come forward to engage with them, they often get wasted. Um, one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking just now, but to tie in with the follow-up on the first question, um, uh, when you were talking about coming up through that grassroots um, and de uh, working with SAOs and AOs, um, how important do you think it, it is for us as the Article Association and as you are uh, um, campaigning on terms of diversity and equality, approaching those groups to have them come to us so that they can um, do videos with us, we can do videos with them, and we can start disseminating it through the SAOs and AOs rather than trying to filter it up through the party? I think that's such a good, that's an amazing idea. I yeah. that idea. Um, I think there have been, there's reports that I've recently looked that has kind of categorically said there are fundamental issues in the way that party HQs, AOs, communicate with members and vice versa. There are people that have messaged me saying, how do I become a candidate? Now, I'm not a candidate and I haven't been a candidate, but I know how to get there. And it's kind of worrying that members are coming to me and saying to me, how do I become a candidate when it should be local party knowledge i understand we're in the midst of a pandemic but that should be local party knowledge yeah. and they should be communicating that to their members so i think yeah it is really important that we all work collaboratively and we all share knowledge and we all share best practice because at the end of the day there's no point us working in silos because it doesn't get us anywhere yeah. like there's a reason that emld collapsed there's a reason why that was and when i was interning with them there was a very much an analogy of us First, them as in the party first what they do and now that doesn't exist from what i understand because they've got a new organization that will probably have a different way in which they approach them so yeah it's really important to communicate issues it is really important to kind of bring people in and say are you willing to do this because at least that way you can go yeah we've tried and if they don't want to do it that's their loss because they're losing out on engaging more people and showing what they do to encourage people to get involved. And you have to bear in mind, not everyone will feel overly comfortable campaigning. Not everyone's going to feel overly comfortable standing on their local party exec, but they might feel comfortable joining an SAO yeah. or an AO. So we have to give people those options. And I think we're only able to do that if we communicate with them through platforms like the Radical Association and Lib Dem Voice and vice versa. No, that's brilliant. Yes, I, I'm certainly. I think we need to do a lot more networking across sort of like ground level, and so we can, so that when people are part of an SAO or AO, they can then go back to the local party with the knowledge that they need and pass it through the local party. I think perhaps Absolutely. part of what log charms the Lib Dems a lot is um, we've decentralised so much that sometimes we don't communicate with each other anymore, and it's like mm -hmm. sometimes you do feel like you wave and go, "Hello, please listen." <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think there are times where you feel that sometimes you are smashing your head on a brick wall and we shouldn't have to feel like that. There are yeah. ways that we can combat that if we communicate to each other. Guaranteed, there will be some people that you may speak to that aren't on the same page as you. But if the referendum has taught us anything, we need to be more open-minded to the way that people voted and communicated. Because, yeah, we're a party that were firmly remain, but not all of our members might have not always voted for Remain. They might have voted a different way. And you need to have that balancing of opinion because unless you have both opinions, we're never going to be able to grow. So it is really important to communicate and not work in silos. But it's also important to share that knowledge. Um, so hopefully that's something that can be worked on in the future. Don't hold that down to me, but I'm hoping <laughs> someone can work on it. Well, that very neatly brings me on to my fourth question, and this one's actually going to be a slightly more of a curveball than I originally planned. Um, so originally I was going to ask um, that as somebody who campaigns passionately for equality and diversity, what achievement are you most proud of? And you have actually mentioned quite a few of them, and you and should be incredibly proud of them. So I am going to ask you which achievement you're most incredibly proud of, but I'm also going to ask you what achievement would you like to achieve in the future? What is your goal for the future? Ah, uh, that's exciting. Um, okay, so I'd say I've got a few achievements that I'm really proud of. Obviously, the diversity of the role. Um, I think being able to shape the way that we communicate diversity on the ground in Watford and showing people in this constituency that we do care about diversity through 
the International Women's Day event, Diversity Dinar, and encouraging people to go to my local temple and learn about Diwali. Massively, massively love that. Also speaking at um, Lib Dem Point about being a diversity officer, Lib Dem Expand, I could go on. Um, I could say speaking on feminism apply liberally, got the name right this time. <laughs> um, at conference in 2016 was so amazing to me. I've never really spoken publicly before. So being able to speak about diversity on a public platform alongside Belinda Brooks Gordon, Joe Simpson, Michael Preston, Sarah Brown, Josh Dixon, something I'm never going to forget, always cherish that moment. And also introduced me to April, never really left her side since. Um, and I'd say finally, the organising a trip to Brussels with 10 people and being able to question um, MEP Sheila Ritchie, Judith Bunting and Lucy, Lucy Nathenga on what they do to enhance our rights in the EU was something amazing. What do I want to achieve in the future? Well, how long have you got, Jazz? Um, I will say that within the role of the Vice Chair, yes, it's a very new organisation. I'd love for us to be able to share best practice in the way that diverse members are communicating messages to people in their own constituencies, because at the moment, I think that's something that is not there. Um, I'd love for us to be more diverse than the candidates that we have, but also bear in mind that not all candidates will be part of SAOs. There might be people who are party members who are LGBTQ, but are also BAME. And they might feel that they want to be in both LGBTQ plus to Lib Dem and LDRCE, or they might be young liberals and also want to be in the LGBT plus Lib Dem because they're passionate about it. And I think breaking down those barriers is something that's really important. So if we can improve communication between those SAOs, I'd love that. Obviously, it's not down to me, but I'd love that. I think if we can give some money to diversity so we are able to utilise that effectively. Maybe we will have a hope in winning future elections because there's always this debate about money and stereotypically which parties seem to be like the most diverse or seem to be engaging with the people who are LGBTQ plus or people who are disabled and we need to kind of differentiate ourselves. And although we can do that all at a voluntary level, if there was some money allocated, then we would be able to create campaigns that would hopefully make a difference. Um, so I think that's really important. But I think from a vice chair level, there were some exciting things happening and there's some exciting projects happening personally with myself and yourself and uh, Sam and April and the Radical Association are really good in kind of breaking down those barriers and speaking about things that you wouldn't necessarily speak about. So I think that's really important. So yeah, I think what I'd say, the main thing is in a nutshell, as I go on, um, communication, funding, and having like share, sharing best practices as a platform. Because if we're able to do that, then hopefully in the future, we'll hopefully be able to encourage more people to become candidates or perhaps get involved with their local party and stand in the local party exec or stand for a federal committee. As long as they're feeling politically engaged and there isn't as many bumps in the road, then that would probably be a good thing to achieve. Hopefully. Oh, that's good. That's good. Um, maybe, possibly one day, Deepa Vaya as leader of the Lib Dems, future Prime Minister, oh. possibly even President of a federal Britain. Hopefully. I mean, yeah. we never, you never know what the future's going to hold. You never know. I mean, I think I've kind of figured my passions are very much grassroots. So I think the next thing I would like to go on is the Federal Party Development Committee, if I was lucky enough to get on that. But I'm very aware that these federal committees are in place for a while so I have to wait but it gives me an opportunity to kind of uh, build my knowledge and share best practice and hopefully encourage more people to stand for parliament not myself but other people <laughs> but, uh, yeah no that no that sounds like a really really good goal to have ahead of you I and mean, you've certainly achieved a lot already so but yes I mean you are right there are there is work ahead of I think everybody in the party but yeah I mean certainly with people like you pushing for it we're we're going to get there a lot sooner than we would have done otherwise hopefully thank yeah. you so much no it's hopefully okay we get there
Well, thank you. That was all the questions I had. So thank you very much for joining me today, Deepa. That was um, Deepa Vaya, the Vice Chair of the Racial Diversity Campaign and general all-round excellent person. I had to have to live there as well, which is why we're all being interviewed at the moment. Yay! Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> nice for interviewing me, Jasmine. And thank you. It was brilliant interviewing you as well. <laughs>